Hey YouTubers, this is Lonnie Clark, Nuts for Art again. I'm here to read a little bit more of our book, Population Control Through Nuclear Pollution. And uh, I'm just going to press on. We're in Chapter 9, Plutonium, Public Health and Technological Arrogance. <clears throat> Plutonium is an element that was virtually non-existent in the Earth's natural crust. The present worldwide inventory of plutonium is, for the most part, man-made. By far the major use of plutonium at the present time is in the manufacture of nuclear bombs. Consequently, although it was not intended by its discoverers, the name plutonium is quite apt for this element. Plutonium, the element of the Lord of Hell. Plutonium has several isotopes the most important being plutonium-239, which is used in the manufacture of nuclear bombs. In addition, plutonium-239 is planned to be the major fissionable fuel in the future as a result of the development of the fast breeder reactors. Plutonium-239 is a radioactive isotope of an extremely long half-life, 24,000 years. Hence, its radioactivity will remain undiminished within human time scales. The other isotope of plutonium that is, excuse me, the other isotope of plutonium that is of interest is plutonium-238. This isotope has a much shorter half-life, about 80 years. Interest in it has developed because it can be used in small power supplies for the production of power to drive such things as mechanical heart pumps and pacemakers that adjust the heartbeat of humans. It is presently used as an auxiliary power system for space vehicles. The space vehicle application of plutonium-238 will be discussed later in this chapter. The cancer-inducing potential of plutonium is well known. An amount as small as one ten millionth of an ounce injected under the skin of mice has caused cancer. A similar amount injected into the bloodstream of dogs induced a substantial incidence of bone cancer. Fortunately, the body maintains a relatively effective barrier against the entry of plutonium into the bloodstream. Also, because of the short range in tissue, <clears throat> I'm sorry. Also, because of the short range in tissue of the radiation emitted by plutonium isotopes, the radiation from plutonium deposited on the surface of human skin does not usually penetrate to the depth of any sensitive tissue. Unfortunately, the lung is quite vulnerable to plutonium. <clears throat> The vulnerability of the lung to plutonium results from the fact that when plutonium metal is exposed to air, it ignites spontaneously. So let's read that again. The vulnerability of the lung to plutonium results from the fact that when plutonium metal is exposed to air, it ignites spontaneously. As it burns, it forms numerous very small particles of plutonium oxide. When these particles of plutonium oxide are inhaled, they are deposited in the very deep portions of the lung. Tiny plutonium dioxide particles remain immobilized in the deep portion of the lung for hundreds of days. And during this time, their radiation is able to affect the cancer-sensitive cells of the lung. Particles of plutonium oxide represent an intense source of radiation. However, due to the nature of the radiation which they emit, they will only irradiate a small volume of tissue. For example, if the plutonium oxide contained in a tiny particle, four one hundred thousandth of an inch in diameter, were distributed uniformly in the human lung, the plutonium would deliver a dosage of 0 0.0002 rem per year to the lung tissue. On the other hand, if this plutonium dioxide were contained in a single particle, the average dosage to that tissue would be that to be irradiated would be 500 rem per year to the closest 20 alveoli, which are lung sacs. 
the dose would exceed 3,000 rem per year. These dosages are a million to 10 million times larger than the dose that would be delivered if this plutonium were distributed uniformly throughout the entire lung. New subtitle. <clears throat> plutonium tolerance level may err greatly. Thus, particles of plutonium oxide result in an intense but localized tissue radi irradiation. Particles, therefore, result in an extremely non-homogeneous distribution of, of the dosage to the lung. A small portion of the lung tissue is subjected to extremely high dosages of ra irradiation from a particle while the rest of the lung tissue is totally unaffected by the particle's radiation. The Internal Commission on Radiological Protection has recommended a tolerance level for the exposure of human lungs to plutonium. However, the tolerance level relates to the uniform distribution of plutonium throughout the entire lung, and the ICRP, International Commission on Radiological Protection, indicates that this may be greatly in error when applied to particulates of plutonium oxide which result in this non-homogeneous distribution of the dose. The Commission states, quote, In the meantime, there is no clear evidence to show whether, with a given mean absorbed dose, the biological risk associated with a non-homogeneous distribution is greater or less than the res risk resulting from the more diffuse distribution of that dose in the lung, unquote. <clears throat> the Commission is effectively saying that there is no guidance with respect to the risk from the non-homogeneous exposure of the lung by particles of plutonium oxide. Hence, the maximum permissible lung burden is meaningless for plluton particles, and so is the maximum permissible air concentration which is derived from it. Get that? Hence, the maximum permissible lung burden is meaningless for plutonium particles, and so is the maximum permissible air concentration which is derived from it. By now, this far along in the book, the reader will undoubtedly not be surprised to discover that regardless of the statement by the ICRP, the ever-optimistic AEC has adopted the plutonium standard recommended by the ACR, ICRP for uniform lung irradiation to apply to particulates of plutonium oxide. These motherfuckers, they knew that they were going to harm people. I swear to God. <clears throat> Some two years ago, our colleague Donald Giesemann who is a research scientist at the Biomedical Division Lawrence Radiation Laboratory, began to review the literature concerned with the hazards of these highly radioactive particles in the deep portions of the lung. He was prompted to begin this study as a result of questions concerning the safety of space nuclear systems and questions asked by the directors at the Livermore Laboratory concerning the weapons program. His review of the literature pointed up, excuse me, his review of the literature pointed up a very sobering fact. The experimental data indicated that when small portions of tissue were exposed to highly, extremely high dosages of radiation, cancer was almost inevitable result. Wow. The experimental data indicated that when small portions of tissues were exposed to extremely high dosages of radiation, cancer was an almost inevitable result. In other words, the experimental am animal data that irradiation by particulates of plutonium oxide represented a unique carcinogenic hazard. His analysis indicated that exposure at the maximum permissible lung burden for plutonium oxide if the exposure occurred at particulates of plutonium oxide was at least 100 times worse than imagined. The fuck? His analysis indicated that exposure at the maximum permissible lung burden for plutonium oxide 
if the exposure occurred as particulates of plutonium oxide was at least a hundred times worse than imagined. The studies which Giesemann was able to use to arrive at this estimation of the risk associated with plutonium oxide particles were not experiments dealing with the irradiation of the lung by plutonium oxide particles. Therefore, the results of his analysis were only capable of indicating that there was a very strong possibility that the effects of plutonium oxide particles were far worse than the uniformly, than the uniformly distributed dose to the lung. Wow. New subtitle. Experiments fail to consider a low dosage effect. Of course, fuckers. The one experiment funded by the AEC that related directly to the exposure of plutonium oxide in the lungs was conducted at the Hanford facility of the AEC by Dr. W. J. Blair. He's a, he was associated with the Pacific Northwest Laboratories Battelle Memorial Institute. However, the design of the study proved to be its major failure, isn't it always? In the typical over-optimistic attitude of the AEC's Division of, Biological and, of Biology and Medicine, the assumption appears to have been made that exposure at the allowable plutonium guidelines would result in an insignificant damage to the exposed individual. It appears that using this assumption, the experiment on beagle dogs at Hanford was therefore conducted at dosage levels a hundred or more times that of the maximum permissible concentration. The assumption seems to have been that, that one had to expose the animals considerably above the guidelines to be able to observe any biological effect of the radiation. The results of the experiment undoubtedly came as a tremendous surprise to the AEC. Essentially, all of the animals that survived the first few years of the experiment developed lung cancer. The experiment tells us nothing about exposure to lower dosages. All the experiments indicated, all the experiment indicates is that the AEC is funding the experiment, was over optimistic concerning the potential effects of plutonium oxide in the lung. The AEC is reluctant to accept the analysis of Dr. Giesemann. It chooses to apply the ICRP's recommendations for the uniform radiation of human lungs by plutonium at such facilities as the Dow Chemical operated Rocky Flats Plutonium Facility near Denver. Holy fuck a mabole, really? Dow Chemical operated operated Rocky Flats Plutonium Facility near Denver. Oh my God. The AEC uses this recommendation and applies it to the radiation from particulates of plutonium oxide. Giesemann does not really stand alone in his analysis, although he is the only one who has given a quantitative estimate of the enhanced risk from the particles. Dr. Baer, who performed the Beagle Plutonium Experiment, and his colleagues in a paper given in October 1969 at an Oak Ridge Symposium on in the inhalation, on inhalation carcinogenesis, stated that, quote, non-uniform irradiation of the lung from deposited radioactive particles is clearly more carcinogenic than uniform exposure i.e. on the total lung basis, unquote. We may also quote from Dr. K. Z. Morgan's testimony in January 1970 before the Joint Committee on Atomic Energy of the U.S. Congress. Dr. Morgan is one of the United States' two members of the main committee of the International Commission on Radiological Protection. He has been a member of that committee longer than anyone else who is on it. And he is also director of the Health Physics Division of the Oak Ridge National Laboratory. Dr. Morgan stated, quote, There are many things about radiation exposure we do not understand, and we will continue to be and there will continue to be uncertainties until health physics 
can provide a coherent theory on radiation damage. This is why some of the basic research studies of the USAEC are so important. D.P. Giesemann and Tamplin have pointed out recently the problems of plutonium-239 particles and the uncertainty of the risks to a man who carries such particles in high specific activities of his lungs." Unquote. In a talk presented at the University of Colorado on April 19, 1970, Dr. Giesemann, uh, Dr. Giesemann stated, quote, Finally, I would like to describe the problem of a large, in a large, let me repeat that, I'm sorry. Finally, I would like to describe the problem in a larger context. By the year 2000, plutonium-239 has been conjectured to be a major energy source. Commercial production is projected at 30 tons per year by 1980, in excess of 100 tons per year by the year 2000. Plutonium contamination is not an academic question. Let me repeat that sentence. Plutonium contamination is not an academic question. Unless fusion reactor feasibility is demonstrated in the near future, the commitment will be made to liquid metal fast breeder reactors fueled by plutonium. Since fusion reactors are presently speculative, the decision for liquid metal fast breeders should be anticipated and plutonium should be considered as a major pollutant of remarkable toxicity and persistence. Considering the enormous economic inertia involved in the commitment, it is imperative that public health aspects be carefully considered and honestly defined prior to active promotion of the industry. To live sanely with plutonium, one must appreciate the potential magnitude of the risk and be able to monitor against all significant hazards. An undeterminate amount of plutonium has gone off-site at the major facility of the Dow Chemical Rocky Flats plant, 10 miles upwind from a metropolitan area, Denver, Colorado. The loss was unnoticed. The original is somewhat speculative, as, it, as is the ultimate deposition. That means they lost an undetermined amount, has gone off site. That means they have no idea where it's at. <clears throat> the origin is somewhat speculative, as is the ultimate deposition. The health and safety of public and the health and safety of public and workers are protected by a set of standards for plutonium acknowledged to be meaningless. Let me read that sentence again. I apologize, but this isn't making sense to me. The health and safety of public the health and safety of public and workers are protected by a set of standards for plutonium acknowledged to be meaningless. Such things make a travesty of public health and raise serious questions about the hurried acceptance of nuclear energy." Unquote. Who did that come from again? Dr. Giesemann at the University of Colorado on April 19, 1970. Wow. 45 years ago almost to the day. So we are now on a new subtitle called Space Nuclear Auxiliary Power or SNAP which I'm sure all of us have heard of the SNAP program. The space nuclear auxiliary power systems with which this section is concerned are those which contain plutonium-238. In these power systems, the radioactive decay of the plutonium-238 produces heat, which is then converted into electrical energy. One of the space systems, which was designated SNAP-9A, burned up in the atmosphere in April 1964. Subsequently, tiny particles of plutonium-238 oxide were distributed over the surface of the Earth where they were inhaled to, to contaminate human lungs. The event caused President Johnson to insist that any subsequent SNAP reactors 
which were to be fired into space, should be reviewed by a number of different boards composed of experts from the AEC, the Department of Defense, the, and the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, NASA, right? As we shall see, regardless of the President's attempts, these review boards represented nothing more than a facade. Tamplin became a member of the AEC's Division of Biological and Medicine Committee on Space Radiological Matters. I'm going to end here. I just noticed I'm at 20 minutes. So, I guess my view count's going to go up to 301 right away since I use those key words like activists and murderers. But I don't consider myself an activist, honestly. I guess I consider myself a human being, and it's my duty to stop the monsters that are intent on destroying our planet, and that's really where I'm at. I mean, I come at this with the right heart. I'm not against capitalism. I'm against murder capitalism. I'm against fascist capitalism. Uh, I do have to say it did freak me out that my view count went up to 300 within about, I don't know, an hour on the last two videos. So be curious to see what happens now. So I'll end here. Um, I always say that and then I think of one more thing to say, which I just did. Uh, the Post Ignorance Project is getting geared up to put a page up. I'll put a page up next week. We're going to attempt to fund Kevin to go to Europe. It's a pretty hefty project. He wants to stay over there for a few months to interact and learn what the Europeans are doing to stop and see if we can't find a crack here to bring people together. And um, I'll let you know more about that in a little while. And I guess I did want to say something about the marine biologists that have been coerced and been told that they can't talk. Uh, I kind of feel sorry for them, but I believe that they have an obligation to tell the truth. So we can't mess around anymore. Uh, it's super grave. This is not good. e, &E news is progressively worse. And the world's just spinning around, acting like it's the Super Bowl, baby. So I'm going to end here. Uh, we're at 22.38. Ciao, you guys. Put your courage feet on. Let's put our thinking caps on. Let's figure out a way to interact, bring ourselves together, and uh, stop these monsters because they are obviously got no boundaries. They'll just kill everything on the entire planet. So ciao, you guys.